Hi, my name is Declan McKibben. I'm the Executive Director with ADAPT, the SFI Centre for Digital Content Technology Research. We're hosted in Trinity College and in Dublin City University, and we've got researchers across eight universities in Ireland. Uh, so welcome to the second webinar in the Creating Tomorrow's World series, and today we're focusing on healthcare. And digital health is a key research focus for ADAPT. We have researchers in medicine, biomedical science, computer science and engineering, and we're collaborating to drive forward research in rare diseases and in e health. So we're combining cutting edge data science and semantic web technologies to support data integration, data analytics and machine learning for applied clinical research. So today I'm delighted to welcome three great speakers who are going to explore different aspects of digital health. We have Professor Martin Curley, who needs no introduction. Martin is the Director of Digital Transformation and Open Innovation with the Health Service Executive. And his work is helping enable the digital transformation of Ireland's health service. Frank O'Donnell is the Head of Public Sector for Microsoft Ireland. And in this role, Frank is responsible for Microsoft's government health and education business across the island of Ireland. And lastly, we have Professor uh, Lucy Hederman, Lucy is a lecturer at Trinity's School of Computer Science and Statistics and a funded investigator with ADAPT. Lucy's research interests include incorporating clinical guideline knowledge into electronic healthcare records and the design of ICT systems to leverage existing organizational data and documents in support of knowledge work. Uh, before we kick off the presentations, uh, just to let you know that we will take questions in the questions and answers facility within Zoom and we can address these then at the end of the three presentations. So without further ado, I'd like to welcome Martin Curley. So Martin, over to you. Great, thank you very much, uh, Declan. So I'm just going to share my screen and I'll just check with you that you can all see that. Great, uh, can everybody see my screen? Yep. Great, um, so it's a real pleasure and a privilege to have the opportunity to uh, talk today. I'm very much looking forward to the presentations from Lucy and Frank as well. Um, so uh, I'll talk briefly about healthcare in the digital age and we're building a collaboration with um, the ADAPT Centre um, and shortly we'll be launching a, a shared living lab uh, focused on the use of digital in neurological diseases. But to start with, uh, so we're th talking about healthcare in the digital age, well we need to recognise that healthcare is about a decade behind other industries in digitalizing. Uh, but there is a real opportunity to catch up. But we also need to recognize that so significantly behind kind of mainstream OECD countries, you can see us to, to the right there. Uh, but with that context, we're seeing we're at a unique point in time where we have multiple disruptive technologies all showing up at the same time and they're all information uh, technology related. And healthcare is probably the most information intensive industry there that there is so there's a real opportunity to contribute so whether it's cloud or ai and machine learning or big data or internet of things or mobile and social and blockchain uh, robotics uh, we we actually have a perfect storm so what we want to do in the hse is actually ride that storm and make accelerated progress so the hse is the primary organization responsible for healthcare delivery in ireland and between direct and indirect employees uh, we have 130,000 employees, so it would be the largest organization uh, on, the, uh, on the island of Ireland. Uh, it is a little bit like a super tanker. And what we're trying to do is work very in a very agile way with an organization, actually, which is designed to actually minimize variation. Uh, the strategy we've adopted, we talk about this, we call it our leapfrog strategy. So right now on the left we have a primarily paper-based system it's presence-based you have to go to hospital it's acute based and it's all paper records uh, we hope to avoid actually implementing the typical monolithic electronic health record and go to this new digital health model one that's actually home and community-based where remote monitoring is predominant we have proactive and predictive healthcare. it's cloud-based it's open sourced um, etc um, as many of you be aware, we had a, you know, a significant ransomware attack that is still being worked on, but any of the cloud-based solutions uh, that have been developed in the digital transformation portfolio, none of them were, um, you know, and it certainly um, makes a strong case from a resilience and security standpoint, the adoption of cloud. And so Microsoft, Azure, and AWS 
they can afford to spend a lot more on cybersecurity than any one organization on their own. So that's a, a good path for uh, cyber resilience. So on this journey, uh, we assessed ourselves to be at level one on a capability maturity framework. And we're working with a number of different companies to actually build out uh, what this maturity roadmap looks like for Ireland. But our goal by 2025, 2026 is to be um, the European leader in, in digital health. So we're working with, for example, with Huawei uh, and Dell and Roche and Medtronic uh, to actually build out this uh, framework. And this will actually allow us to measure our progress over the next couple of years. Um, we have uh, five levels of, uh, or five levers or vectors in our digital strategy. Um, I don't have time to talk about them, but I'll just mention some highlights. We have an overarching digital transformation strategy that's been agreed for uh, the HSE uh, about three weeks ago. I presented it to the board of the HSE and was, you know, really strongly endorsed. Uh, we have a new master's in digital health transformation, actually, and this was uh, co-designed and co-delivered with all eight um, Irish universities and Lucy was involved in helping us develop at a syllabus uh, for that. Out of, we've just had the first sort of graduations from that program and that yielded not only sort of, you know, 44 uh, now digitally uh, informed, you know, physicians and nurses and doctors and pharmacists, etc. But we have 21 digital change projects delivered. 18 of those are viable and are in the process of being implemented, if not already implemented. We have a portfolio of 50 disruptive digital innovations that we manage, I'll, I'll come back to that. We have a strategy called Stay Left, Shift Left, which we use for uh, orchestrating the innovation ecosystem. And we also have a forum, which we call a Digital Academy Forum for spreading and solutionizing and, and sharing uh, new digital technology, digital health ideas. Um, our overarching strategy is something that we call stay left, shift left. It's very simple. We are looking for digital interventions that help people who are already well, stay well in their homes. Or if you happen to have a chronic condition, you can be managed best of all from home. Shift left is about moving patients who end up in an acute setting as quickly as possible to a com community and a home care setting. Now, every time we see a digital uh, health um, innovation, we're looking for four different characteristics. We'd like to see an improvement in the quality of care, the quality of life, an improvement in the clinician experience and a reduction in the cost of care. And what we're finding because of the power of digital, we're seeing 10x improvements in quality of care or cost reduction and, uh, and so on. Just do a little sli slide build here you'll see actually most of the solutions and companies that we're working with in our digital transformation portfolio are actually concentrated in, in home and community and we've made very significant progress. I want to highlight one um, is a company called Syncrify in our living lab in uh, Cavan. And there we are, um, we have a vital signs automation project and one of our priorities for the next year and a half will be to deploy vital signs automation uh, to uh, all of our wards and actually there are too many people who develop sepsis in our wards and too many unanticipated cardiac arrests and this is a problem we can fix through digital technology. Uh, we've built a network of, of living labs all the way from Letterkenny down to Cork and we're doing everything from emergency general surgery digital solutions to digital respiratory solutions to robotic ultraviolet cleaning. Uh, one of the things that has changed is our agility. In the past, the HSE was impenetrable and to get a solution deployed, it would take two, three, five years. And we've put in a new innovation funnel and pipeline to actually help us manage that. And we go through four phases, an exploration gate, a proof of concept gate, a demonstrator, and then broad adoption. This is what our funnel looked like before uh, COVID-19. And this is what it looked like directly after COVID-19 and um, we, we now have an innovation pipeline that's, that's, that's really full and is really adding a tremendous uh, benefit. Uh, to, just to give a couple of ideas, in the, in the week that COVID showed up on our shores, we worked with a small Irish company called Patient and Power and we were able to, you know, in a day or two, build a prototype which I demonstrated at the IIEA 
Uh, within five weeks, we had the solution being prescribed across the country. And this was certainly a record, you know, typically, as I said, it, it would have taken two to two and a half years to get the solution deployed. So we now have one of the most advanced um, monitoring solutions for COVID-19. And, and today, even though, uh, you know, for quite a while, we have more COVID patients being, being monitored from home than are, are, are in our hospitals. We've extended this and we have a virtual respiratory living lab of 850 patients who are living with conditions such as COPD or asthma or cystic fibrosis, and they're all being monitored um, in, in their homes. They have better quality of life, they have equivalent standard of care, uh, there's much, much lower costs, and there's much better clinician experience. Another solution that we've deployed um, very similarly in the early days of COVID with Professor Richard Costello of RCSI, uh, we deployed a technology called RespiraSense that uh, automatically sends the respiration rate uh, to a, a central uh, you know, monitor in the nurse's station and it's tracking the respiration rate and typically respiration rate has been, it's been very subjective, has, has been recorded by nurses and there's a tremendous amount of variability. In fact, one of our trials in, in Bowman showed that 80% of the nurse recorded respiration rates were, were incorrect. And that's not because the nurses were, were bad, it's just difficult to, to capture. So this is a, a unique technology and we're now in the process of deploying this to many of the, the acute hospitals in the, in the country and we should be wrapped up with that next month. But importantly for COVID patients, we get about 12 hours advance notice of a hypoxic event when a patient is going to significantly deteriorate. And again, this is a solution where we've moved from a three-year implementation plan to um, you know, less, than, less than three months. Uh, another significant um, innovation um, is with a Trinity-based startup called Acara and um, Professor Connor McGinn. And this isn't um, an image from a, uh, an advanced American hospital. This is from the Midlands Regional Hospital in Tullamore. And there we've been deploying um, a, a UV uh, autonomous uh, robot uh, to decontaminate radiology rooms. This solution is five or 10 times faster than the human cleaning teams. It's three times more effective and it's 2.5 times uh, cheaper. And uh, just to kind of demonstrate the agility, I'm just on my right hand. This is um, what Connor originally brought to me. He, he met with me last year in March with just a drawing. And I said to Connor, well, can you come back with a prototype? And in two days, he actually came back with a device that I'm showing you there on the right. And now that has been involved or evolved to a production ready solution and uh, that's used, used um, you know, on a daily basis in Tullamore. And we're now looking to explore how we can um, expand this uh, nationally and, and, and indeed beyond. Uh, so we have a portfolio of disruptive technologies. We're working with ADAPT uh, on several of these, the Avatar uh, Louise. Uh, we've been trialing this for tracking and tracing. We've been also working to explore how we could um, use Tara, the, the COVID contact uh, tracing, uh, agent. And there are lots of other areas that we're working from mobile x-ray to pill cam technology, uh, to artificial intelligence, to AI assisted uh, echo tests, and, and so on. Um, but just to finish, because we also wanted to talk about data, uh, patient health literacy is very important. And Ireland, you know, similar to our adoption of electronic health records, we're very much a laggard. So we're down there with it, Italy and Latvia in terms of the percentage of Irish patients who are acting or who are um, you know, seeking uh, health information uh, online. And we know that patients with low health literacy, they're more likely to visit an emergency room, they have more hospital stays, are less likely to follow treatment uh, plans, et cetera. Uh, so we work and you know, create this shared space between doctors uh, and patients. And one of the uh, companies that has come through our innovation pipeline is a company called My Patient Space, and we're now moving to an advanced demonstrator. And what they provide is a rapid configuration, no code, drag and drop environment for creating patient apps. Uh, the outcome of that is a digital patient companion. And then there also is a clinician interface. So the clinician can interact with the patient and they can also see trends. Uh, so we, we've just you know, formalized the commercial contract 
with my patient space and we're launching uh, patient apps in seven different areas in digital sleep and respiratory and rheumatology and hematology, oncology, chronic kidney disease and cancer clinical studies. So we've identified this gap around poor digital patient uh, interaction and engagement and digital literacy. And we're now moving from, we have had a uh, proof of concept in St. James's Hospital and we're, we're now moving uh, to a demonstrator and hopefully early next week we'll be up um, in St. Vincent's on the, on the first of these applications and very shortly with rheumatology in, in Tala and so on. Uh, so uh, just to note also we're a laggard in use of health data for secondary purposes so we're right out there on the left and possibly only Japan is, is less ready than Ireland in terms of using EHR data for secondary purposes. So uh, we very much want to collaborate with the ecosystem and with ADAPT uh, to fix this problem. <clears throat> so for those SMEs or actually large companies um, who are uh, interested in working with the HSE and we've, we've now very much changed our perspective to Open Innovation 2.0, I'd encourage you to uh, register your solution or technology uh, on our uh, HSE digital transformation.ie uh, website. And that's on the left hand side there, the digital innovation call. And the solution that I just shared with you from my patient space, uh, that was a result of my patient space uh, responding to our digital COVID 19 uh, call. I'll finish with a quote from Ilya Prizhojin. Uh, and he says, in an unstable, complex system, small islands of coherence have the potential to change the whole system. Uh, so small interventions actually can drive uh, pretty dramatic um, uh, interventions. And we, we look forward to continuing the collaboration uh, with the ADAPT Center and indeed with Microsoft uh, on our journey to digital transformation of the Irish healthcare system. So thank you. And I'll, I'll hand you back to Declan. Thank you, Martin. Um, I have to say it's so impressive. You really have to be commended for um, really having had such a huge impact uh, stimulating and cultivating the health innovation ecosystem in Ireland. Just extraordinary level of activity across all sorts of um, areas. Um, Akara, of course, uh, Conor McGinn is, is, a, is a funded investigator in ADAPT. You may know, uh, the audience may know him through Stevie Robot as well, something we're collaborating on. Um, and uh, th there's so many things I could pick out from your talk there, but one that you mentioned early on is cloud and really the importance of cloud in terms of uh, scaling capability and, and so on. And um, our next speaker, the speaker, Frank, is with Microsoft and uh, Microsoft you know, as a hyperscaler and as a, a software company, a platform company, um, is clearly one of the major leaders uh, globally in this space. And um, so I'm going to hand over to uh, Frank O'Donnell, Head of Public Sector for Microsoft. Thank you, Declan. Um, and try and share my screen. Are you all seeing that, hopefully? Um, can you see my screen yet? Not yet. Let me try again. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Thanks for the introduction, Declan, and thank you, Martin. Um, I kind of just realized why I don't like to follow Martin in uh, presentations. So uh, anyway, <laughs> I will uh, I will cover a few areas for you. Uh, the interest is I'm, I'm responsible for um, healthcare is one of the big areas I'm responsible for within my remit in Microsoft. Um, but also worth saying that prior, to, I'm in Microsoft about four years. Prior to that, I was in management consulting for quite a long time. And, and uh, within KPMG and within PA Consulting, I led a lot of work with the health system in Ireland. So from the perspective of electronic health records, of performance management in hospitals, and even uh, many years ago, we did a review of financial management. So um, some different perspectives. And some of that flows into some of the examples I'm going to talk about um, within the following few slides. Um, firstly, perhaps just as a, as, a, as a bit of context, if this works. Um, a lot of the, the, the focus obviously on, on data. Um, one of the areas that Martin mentioned was the whole point about the system being presence-based largely at the moment. Um, 
I know we are seeing huge interest and, and huge adoption as well of virtual health. Obviously, during COVID has been a big um, impetus for that. Um, but even in Northern Ireland health system, for example, they switched to virtual health quite quickly based on, and working with us actually in our platform. Um, but there are many platforms in use uh, for virtual health, but we see that as a really important aspect of uh, dealing with the challenge that, that are in healthcare. And while healthcare is in this transition to, to become a more sustainable system, I suppose, faced with huge demands and, and increasing demands now after COVID, uh, we see virtual health as one of the big components of that. But it must be done, um, it must be done well on secure platforms, on robust platforms, and also with the right clinical involvement and clinical governance around that. Um, the other, the two middle things here around interoperability and around health outcomes, these are core, I guess, to some of the work of ADAPT and, um, you know, the, the level of unstructured data that is largely unavailable or, or inaccessible for the kind of decision making that's needed within clinical environments. And uh, clinicians really do like data, they like evidence. Um, so getting that to them will dramatically improve uh, the, the, their ability to perform in a, in a difficult environment. Um, and on the health outcomes point, they spend significant time seeking out data, trying to find it uh, and, and unify that in a way that can drive, drive decision-making as well. We do a lot of work and what we, we use a concept of, of uh, giving time back to care. So if we can support clinicians in the right way with our platforms and our solutions, we can allow them to provide more time directly to the patient and less time on, on some of the things that are uh, underpinning that. And that's been a big case in uh, case in point in the US in terms of meaningful use of EHRs, et cetera, that, that has placed burdens on clinicians uh, in terms of data input. The final thing, and we don't need to rehearse this one currently within the Irish context, but the security pressures and the issues around data breaches. Martin did mention that we do uh, spend a lot more than, than many on, on security. It's something in excess of a billion dollars a year that we invest in security in our platform because that simply is our business and, and we can't afford to fail. Um, but I think we th there, there will be learnings from things that have happened in the HSE where there is much greater visibility across the estate, if you like, the technology estate now. And there had to be to get the recovery of those systems uh, in place. And perhaps that provides a foundation for modernization going into the future. So hopefully there's some positives coming from that. Um, uh, in Microsoft, we're a platform company. So we provide the underpinning platform. And many of the innovations that Martin talked about can sit and, and uh, uh, evolve within platforms like ours and their other platform companies as, as hyperscale providers of cloud. Um, and that platform deals with security, identity, interoperability, et cetera, all of those things. Um, but we have three areas in healthcare uh, as a big focus for Microsoft, actually, one of the biggest verticals we have. Uh, we try to support the enhancement of patient engagement and virtual health sits in there. Uh, in the area of the empowering the health teams and their collaboration, things like multidisciplinary teams using our platform, really important work we did in University Hospital Limerick in that area. Uh, and the thing today that I'm focusing on probably more is the improvement of clinical and operational insight. The two areas are, are uh, equally important, I think, clinically, of course, in terms of directly supporting patients and making better decisions from care perspective. But on the operational side, really understanding what goes on within our health system uh, and that for, for senior managers, for policymakers, for government all up is hugely important because to some extent we've been flying blind in some areas uh, in the health system over many years. Uh, and, and, and making all that work, of course, data interoperability is a, is a key part of that. We handle a lot of the technical interoperability, and I know in speaking with Lucy in advance of this, they handle other aspects of interoperability around definitions and things, and, and these things need to work hand in hand for us to really address those challenges. Um, I do want to talk about, so one of the things I'm talking about is something that we have done, I'm, I'm talking about something else in a second that we are doing. Um, but uh, going back to the early stages of COVID, we were asked, I remember getting the call from the at the time from Fran Thompson, I think it was the Saturday morning, um, to say, you know, what could we do to provide the right levels of support 
in their efforts now to manage COVID. That was at the very start, um, uh, I think it was March last year. And we've begun to work with them in a very agile way and in a similar way to so many of the projects that Martin's talked about. We brought clinicians together ourselves as a technology company, operational people within the HSE, and also our partner companies who are uh, often uh, more involved in deploying our technology. Um, and, and working together, we, we addressed many areas within um, the COVID landscape. So initially, the, the health bot was used to support citizens in their queries, etc., about their own condition, about symptoms it's, and all of that, and trying to throttle the demand for the, uh, the call center and trying to ensure that, that citizens got a timely response. Uh, we went, we developed uh, track and trace uh, solutions, uh, contact management, uh, lab testing, and end-to-end -end patient management, if you like, uh, understanding where that patient was at within their care path, uh, let, let's say the COVID care pathway. And all of that data being uh, subsumed into a uh, cloud-based data lake, along with other data on capacity within the system, et cetera to really provide senior management, uh, government officials, ministers, et cetera, uh, with a dashboard that allowed them insight into what was happening. And probably for one, on one of the first occasions, what was happening in real time in the health system. We often have data in healthcare in Ireland, which is a month or two months old that we're trying to understand and act upon. But this was, um, this was pretty much real time data. So I think that shows what can be done in you know, when the focus is there, when the imperative is there, when people come together as a multidisciplinary team to do this type of thing. So I think there's a lot of learnings in that. Um, the second thing is something we're currently working on. Um, and again, it's in the area of, of performance, I guess, across uh, the acute sector in particular. But if you look at what's happening within uh, a particular hospital and the end-to-end -end patient flow, the visibility of that end-to-end -end patient flow is, is limited. There are different fragments of information and data that are available, maybe what's happening in ED, what might be happening in theaters, what might be happening in discharge, but they're not rarely joined together and they're ra rarely visualized in a way that allows you to manage that end-to-end -end flow. And that's important for the clinical teams. It's important at the next level of hospital management or hospital group management. And it's also important at government level to understand capacity in the system. And we have done a proof of concept on this and we're a little bit uh, slowed down at the moment because of the cyber issue, but this is a, a partnership with a company called Healthcare Logic, <clears throat> Australian company that we're working with. And um, this, this will, uh, th is currently in deployment um, in, at full scale. And I think we can see from this that this will deliver productivity gains. It will allow uh, the, the existing uh, capacity to deliver more and often we talk about extra beds new hospitals etc uh, when we see the the wave of demand that's coming but we also have to look at things like this to improve the capacity and the productivity of the system as it currently exists and i think there are there are gains to be had there so so that would be an exciting project going forward <clears throat> the last thing sorry um just i want to touch on something that we did uh, a number of years ago with uh, University Radboud uh, Medical Center in, in the Netherlands, uh, where, and, and this is not uh, unusual to them, this is quite normal across research environments, the requirements that were behind this. Uh, so you take uh, research centers, want to collaborate with health organizations, maybe want to collaborate with pharma or, or other private sector organizations and academia, et cetera. Um, that collaboration needs to be done on a secure platform. You need to be really careful about who you allow access to data. You need to control the data and ensure it doesn't leave the control of the host organization. So there are many different requirements, and yet you want the flexibility and the ability to collaborate and the ability to do so across multiple jurisdictions. So we, we developed on our platform, on our Azure platform, we developed a what we call a digital research environment. Um, where we could manage that data, we could ensure its security, be compliant with local restrictions and regulations, whether that be GDPR or other regulations, and allow access in a global uh, sense to, to different organizations, all controlled by the, the host. Uh, that was quite successful, and Radboud have actually taken this 
and further developed it and now provide that um, to other research organizations globally. Um, but also we've taken it and we've open sourced this. So this is available as an open source solution for Microsoft sitting on the Azure platform uh, for research institutions to use. And we're, we're continually evolving this in partnership with research institutions across the globe. And I thought I'd just mention it today. I think it's something I'm happy to, I don't know the, all the details behind it, right? So I, I'm, but I'm happy to connect directly into the team. I was speaking to one of the team yesterday um, that are currently involved in this and, and I can make those connections uh, going forward. So that's really a, a very short canter through uh, some of the Microsoft's perspectives on this. Hopefully it's given you an idea of the importance of data, how we're actually doing some really good things in an Irish context, but also some of the, the broader possibilities as we go forward. So I'll hand that back to Declan, I think now, and uh, look forward to the conversation later. Great. Uh, thank you, Frank. Uh, that was super interesting. One, one of the takeaways for me is, is your mission to give time back to care, back to clinicians. And uh, I hadn't realized that 70% of time was spent on data ingest and data wrangling. So there's clearly operations for uh, data integration and interoperability automation, while of course being attentive to uh, data privacy and governance um, and consent uh, issues. And that's one of the uh, key research focuses for our next speaker, Professor Lucy Hederman in Trinity College Dublin. And um, it's an area of active research that I'm aware of. So uh, handing over then to Lucy. Okay, good morning. Um, and thank you, Frank and, and Martin, both very, very interesting presentations. And I'm going to follow on quite a lot from the last part of, of Frank's uh, uh, talk. So I'm Lucy Hederman. Uh, I'm a collaborator in ADAPT. Uh, I'm a lecturer in computer science at Trinity College. Uh, and I've been lecturing and researching in health informatics for most of my career. I've mostly been interested in clinical decision support. Uh, and I currently lead the heterogeneity and interoperability uh, challenge within the transparent digital governance strand of ADAPT2. That's a whole lot of big words, but basically ADAPT2 has, has, ADAPT has three broad strands. One of them is called transparent digital governance. And then within that, uh, there are three challenges and one of them is heterogeneity and interoperability. So I'm going to talk more about those topics than, than some of the other ones within ADAPT. Um, and, and this challenge, uh, heterogeneity and interoperability is almost entirely focused on interoperability of health data uh, and, and of the metadata about health data, so data about health data, uh, which we're representing. Now, let's not move forward. Okay, so um, uh, healthcare is a data intensive domain. Um, in addition to, to the clinical data you think of in, in the record, uh, we now have uh, hospital, uh, in hospital job, we now have uh, novel biomarkers, uh, omic data, genomic and other kinds of data, sensor data and other data coming from apps, uh, some of those that uh, Martin mentioned, um, uh, all of which I consider to be patient generated health data, PGHD. And if you bring machine learning and AI techniques to all of this data, you have a powerful engine for research, which I'm going to talk more about today, for healthcare delivery innovation, the kinds of things that Martin mostly was talking about. Um, and, and both of these lead to personalized medicine and, and, and precision medicine. Um, so this research and innovation depends on the availability of relevant quality, meaningful data. Uh, and for example, if you want a prediction model for 30 day hospital readmission, um, you build that uh, prediction model, those prediction models from data about discharged patients, both those readmitted shortly after their discharge and those not. And the models are based on any data about these patients that might impact on their readmission. So what happened when they were in hospital, and we, we, you know, we will have access to that once we have EHRs more, more broadly, uh, but also what's happening to, since they left hospital, which is a little bit more difficult to get access to, uh, both clinical data, uh, medication adherence post-hospital, social data, how they're coping uh, at home, and, and so on. So, so building prediction models, whatever they may be, depends on having access to the data that's relevant to the thing that you're trying to predict. And that's the, the point I'm trying to make. And that data needs to be uh, have good quality uh, and also to be brought together in one place or at least conceptually in one place so that you can reason over it. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit more today about uh, interesting clinical research projects we're working on uh, and the challenges ADAPT is addressing within them. 
So here is a uh, visual of a patient, just focusing on a little bit for a moment, patient wandering along through their life. This is a vasculitis patient. Vasculitis is a rare disease uh, which affects the small blood vessels and, and impacts on people's lungs typically and kidneys, particularly kidneys, which is uh, why my, uh, my colleague, Professor Little, Mark Little, is interested in this, in this area. And they were talking about patients who've already been diagnosed with vasculitis uh, who are trundling along and possibly coming towards a flare event, a relapse event, also known as a flare event. And um, what we're doing uh, in, in this aversion research project is we're uh, gathering information about these patients, but we have information in, in the biobank or the, the registry in the biobank represent up there top leftish. And then we're giving these patients an app. It's a patient and power app, as it happens, um, where they uh, give us information about how they're feeling, how active they are, other things which might help us to understand how they are. But also key is that they're giving us their location data, where they are uh, at various times of the day. And with this location data, uh, sorry, I meant to say in this project, we're interested in the uh, environmental triggers of, vas of vasculitis flare. In other words, what makes them get worse again once they've been under control, their disease under control. Uh, and we believe that weather pollution and uh, infectious diseases may have a, a, an impact on, on the re relapse of their flare. So using the location that we get from the uh, app, we are then able to access the weather, the pollution and the infectious diseases using uh, CIDR data. Uh, that this patient is, is exposed to. And we are then going to uh, pull all that together, data together into, a, into a, a database which ADAPT manages. And then uh, give that information to our artificial intelligence teams, our statisticians in, within ADAPT, who build models to predict flare for the future. And why do we want to know about the patient's flare? Well, because of the predictions, chance, risk of flare, because uh, treatment for vasculitis is very toxic. It's like being on chemotherapy full time. And if we could have a better sense of whether the patient is, is heading towards a flare or a relapse or not, we can give the patient uh, less of these toxic drugs or, or more of these toxic drugs. And that improves the uh, quality of what the, the, the health of, of this patient. So, um, that's an example of the uh, kinds of projects we're involved in. And we are, uh, I'm going to use, uh, go on from this example to some other examples of doing something similar. But clearly you can see from this, some of the challenges are integrating the data, pulling all this data together into one place. And perhaps one that you can tell from this is governance uh, is very important because we have sensitive data about patients, including in this case, in fact, location. So we have to worry about uh, making sure that nobody finds out more more about the patient's locations than, than is necessary, well, that they find out nothing about their locations. Okay, I'm going to mention another project which uh, some of my colleagues in uh, ADAPT are involved in. Um, so this is an East, uh, Precise 4Q is an EU project, as its name suggests, it takes a precision medicine approach, in this case for stroke, uh, and it aims to bring predictive modeling to prevention, treatment, and rehabilitation of stroke. Uh, our colleagues in TU Dublin, John Kelleher and others, are involved in the technologies layer, the blue one there, and the fancy advanced machine learning stuff, developing the predictive models. But they admit that all the grunt work, all the effort in this project is on the data integration, the integration of multidisciplinary data from multiple clinics across multiple jurisdictions. And this is hard. This is, uh, this is hard because real clinical data is messy. Different clinics collect different data in different ways, despite standards, or even though there are standards. And this is more so true across national boundaries. The data is multimodal. There are images, video, genomic data, and other omic data. Uh, and time, the temporal dimension, is poorly represented at all in these data sets. Uh, but time is very important when you're trying to predict things, right? When you're trying to predict the future from the past, understanding trajectories and so on is quite important. So I, I don't mention that one because it's ADAPT is involved, but, but not in the, in the data layer. Coming back to rare diseases, such as the vasculitis I mentioned earlier, or another one, maybe motor neuron disease or ALS, uh, there isn't enough data in Ireland to draw conclusions and model predictions, or, or it, it, we're limited in the amount of data we have. So we're working on international efforts to make collected data available. In, in some cases, we're actually centralizing 
multinational data. That's the plan for our, our, our motor neuron disease uh, project. In others, such as the one represented here, which is FairVASC, uh, which deals with vasculitis, the vast is the vasculitis part, we're adopting a federated approach, which is allowing researchers to access vasculitis registry data across Europe. And the data will stay at the remote sites. A subset of registry data will be extracted to local FairVASC uh, versions of the registry. Those are represented by the uh, red clouds in this diagram. Uh, which are the semantically harmonized versions of what was in the registries originally. And these, these uh, data in the, the semantically harmonized data in the registries at the bottom in the clouds are uh, represented as RDF, uh, knowledge graph data in, and stored in, in triple stores, which is where you store um, RDF data. And then not represented well here, but federated queries, which are co-designed by project partners uh, will be issued against these local triple stores for the purposes of research. And these queries will only return aggregated data. They won't provide access to any individual record. And so the key challenges we're dealing with in Fairvas and similar projects uh, are data interoperability, uh, which is, is kind of represented in this diagram, and data governance, because again, this is sensitive data and we're, we're worried about uh, people getting access to it. So this diagram, I'm not going to focus on at any length, but uh, it's dealing with the interoperability issue, uh, which involves us considering every data item of interest in each registry and trying to agree across the sites with the researchers who want to use this data, what the canonical representation should be, the agreed harmonized representation should be, using standards where available, but uh, sometimes that's not as easy as it sounds. Uh, and then we just have to design mappings from each item to the agreed uh, harmonized version. The FairVASC HIT team, uh, which stands for Harmonization Implementation Team, is working through the process on this diagram at the moment. So as I said, the other key challenge we're dealing with in, in this, these projects is data governance. Um, any project involving individuals' health data has to deal with significant data governance issues. Uh, this graphic shows some of the data sharing uh, and data governance aspects that are being dealt with in the FairVASC project. And these ones are being dealt with in a, in a, in a manual way. Um, there's also a data quality aspect not represented in this diagram. And why does data quality matter so much here? Well, because, um, well, for starters, obviously, if you're trying to do research, you want the data to have good quality. But in another way of thinking about this in the FairVASC project is a researcher coming to this data, uh, thinking about setting up a study, um, would like to know well what data is available, how good is that data, how complete is that data, uh, what um, what everything that, that has to do with quality might impact on the research that's that's to be carried out and whether that research is going to be carried out. In other projects like this one, we're representing data provenance, data provenance is where each data item comes from or how it was computed. How do we get this value for this situation? Uh, what computation, what series of steps did we go through? And provenance is essential for reliable or more important for reproducible research. So representing provenance is an important part of the uh, development of this, this line of research. Um, ADAPT's Transparent Digital Governance Strand is exploring techniques to understand, model, and automate data governance, data quality, data provenance. And semantic web technologies have been used to represent and reason, for example, about GDPR, uh, but other, in other, other kinds of ways that, that impact on data governance. Okay, so there are other um, health topics in the ADAPT heterogeneity and interoperability space. On the left, I'm representing patient-generated health data. My colleagues, Damon Berry and Dymphno Sullivan in TU Dublin and I are looking at patient-generated health data. That's stuff coming from apps, coming from sensors, coming from patients in various different ways. Uh, and looking at how to uh, integrate that data into clinical decision-making and into the electronic healthcare record, right? We've had a lot of work on understanding how to represent clinical data electronically and getting that into the EHR, but data coming from patients is, in diff is different in many ways. And we have to think about how to represent it and how to uh, get it into the EHR and how to, to deal with the governance issues and the, you know, what goes in and what doesn't go in and where did it come from? And how does a clinician understand which of this data is worth, uh, uh, paying attention to and which can, can be uh, should be uh, given a little bit less uh, attention maybe because of its quality uh, uh, the quality of the, of the source. Um, 
the um, Pamela Hussey at DCU, another colleague, is developing standards for interoperability in the area of e-integrated care and personalized health. And so that's also a, a, an interoperability uh, issue. Um, on the right, uh, more broadly in the transparent digital governance space in ADAPT2, uh, Gay Stevens and Mark Little lead public engagement on health data governance and sharing. An upcoming citizens thinking will address what is health information. That sounds like an easy question in some ways, but it's interesting how you decide the bounds of what counts as health information. Is my view about what I should want to share part of my health information? Is my own opinion about my health part of my health information? These are questions that are being asked. And you have to answer those questions before you can decide how to govern that data. Okay, and research by Owen Conlon on the autonomy and responsibility of digital agents uh, may, we haven't done this yet, but maybe applied to agents that manage the sharing of my health data. So if we explore what is my health data and how do I want to share it, then we may think in the future of a, a digital health sharing agent who takes responsibility or some of the responsibility of deciding when to share what with whom. More broadly, and not representing this slide, multiple adapt statistician and ML researchers are addressing health research challenges. Just to give one example, looking at the semi-automated cohortization, in other words, identification of cohorts of patients uh, to identify those with minimum variance for certain criteria. And studying these cohorts would allow us to get insights on how to provide more precise treatments for particular cohorts. In fact, in the Irish Times yesterday in the health supplement, uh, this was discussed in relation to motor neuron disease, um, uh, which is the, uh, or, or Hardiman is, is who we're working on, with on that topic. Okay, and that's me, uh, Don. Thank you for listening to this whistle stop tour of some digital health research in ADAPT2. It is only a subset. Lucy, thanks a million. That was really interesting. Um, I guess the, the, the key takeaways there is just how pervasive, how essential, how utterly core is data uh, to, to all of this, to healthcare innovation and uh, the, the uh, compelling benefits of artificial intelligence in terms of uh, automation and in optimization in uh, personalized and precision medicine and prediction modeling and so on and so forth. So uh, I'd like to thank all the, the three speakers uh, for your um, uh, contributions today. I thought it was a really interesting discussion. We could have gone on for another hour. Um, but there are some questions that I would like to turn to, if that's OK. So I'll just go ahead and call these out from the chat. So um, first up, we have um, our former colleague, actually, and uh, Emeritus Professor Jane Grimson has a question. I'll call it out. It's great to see the fantastic progress that has been made in the past year, thanks to the pandemic. So the silver lining uh, uh, point. How will you ensure that digital transformation does not exacerbate existing health inequalities? given the digital divide, lack of health literacy, and underlying biases in training data sets. So there's a few, there's a few points there. Does anybody want to, to jump in on that one? <clears throat> well, I think digital is democratizing uh, healthcare. So yeah, the, clearly there are some challenges, uh, particularly around digital literacy and digital or inequalities. But I, I think um, overall as a, uh, society we be, become more digitally literate you know definitely we're, we're going to trend towards actually more um <clears throat> your fairer care there certainly is a, an issue in the short term uh, around older um, persons in our society that aren't you know as specifically um digitally literate and i think we need some sort of tactical uh, interventions to to address those but overall i think digital will de democratize healthcare and will really allow um, significant improvements in, in both personal and system efficiency, effectiveness and experience from, from healthcare. Mm -hmm. I just uh, happy to add into that. I think Martin's point is a really good one that uh, it, it can actually help improve the quality of healthcare provision. I can tell you that in one instance where we were providing virtual care to those needing physio, those with cystic fibrosis, rather than travel for an hour into um, uh, the hospital, they could do this from their home. And you know that, that saved travel time and cost, but also some of them were so exhausted by the time they'd get there due to their condition that they wouldn't even be able to take part in the, um, in the physio itself. So I do think though, 
there's a journey here. So it's not a question of switching completely to digital. And there will have to be that transition where we do deal with, uh, you know, we've got to support people in all ways and those that don't have the same access. But government's investing a lot in broadband and in other areas that uh, hopefully will ensure that people have an, an equitable access to this. Great. Okay. Thank you for that. Um, the, there's a question here from Mark Little. Uh, the Innovation 2.0 approach is exciting, although it does create an image of an ultra heterogeneous health ecosystem with many private enterprises interacting with Slauncher Care. How will the HSE keep all of this integrated? That's for Mark, I would have thought. Yeah. Um, no, it's a very good question. Well, we're certainly finding, you know, up until this, the HSE was impenetrable. And I really felt sorry for any SME that was trying to interact uh, with us. The system was designed almost explicitly to keep out variation. Um, I, I think, you know, the way we're orchestrating the ecosystem and very often pairing sort of a large company with a small company with a university, uh, we're actually getting on each of the living labs, we're getting quite a bit of, um, you know, diversity. Um, the, both the UK and Ireland are very much designed as um, heterogeneous systems with the NHS and the HSB, HSE being the dominant, uh, you know, service provider. So that heterogeneity, I think, comes by explicit uh, design. Uh, but we're seeing tremendous um, innovation, you know, from from the edges, and the ability for a small SME, say, to, for example, to partner with with Microsoft and bring their solutions. Uh, up on an Azure platform is is dramatically accelerating the the you know the ability for us to adopt and and, and trial it. So I think it's probably too early to actually form a, um, a, an informed opinion on you know, where the ecosystem will go. But so far in you know in the last year and a half, as we've been um, dramatically you know improving results, we've delivered more in eighteen months than we've had done in a decade. So we'll, we'll continue with it and we can actually come back and address this question in a couple of years when we've seen a few more results. Thanks, Mark. Again, again uh, just so I know it was directed to Martin, but as you mentioned, Microsoft, the, um, the, the example I showed uh, with healthcare logic around the patient flow, et cetera, that's an example of a very innovative specialist organization working in that particular area, but basing then their technology on our platform so that in a technical sense, Microsoft can help by providing that underpinning platform, the scale, the agility, the security, all of those things are handled. Uh, and, and these are examples that, and we're working with more and more small companies and uh, keen to do so as we go forward because the small companies bring real, real innovation really quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, thanks, Frank. So just in the interest of time, I'll take uh, one more question and apologies to those questions that we didn't get to, but this one is from Leona Ryan. I'm a researcher looking at the use of digitally enhanced tech to train healthcare professionals in practice. Do you think there's an appetite for virtual training tools that can be accessed at a time convenient to the user? Declan, maybe I'll take a start on that one. This is already happening and we see this happening globally. So both from an education sense and in a healthcare sense, we've seen some education institutions really pivot during um, COVID, for example, and, and I've had to. Uh, and, and to deliver virtual training. And, and even places like uh, RCSI, for example, they've, they've done some interesting things very quickly in terms of delivering uh, training to clinicians. Um, so there are a lot of good examples, and it is definitely part of the future model, um, a, a more of a hybrid approach in terms of the education and training of professionals. I, I also just add to that, I think there's a, a magnificent opportunity, but I, I remember 15 years ago, <laughs> UC Davis in California actually performing a virtual stent insertion uh, procedure. So this technology is, you know, a couple of decades old, uh, but there, I think there's a, you know, a really um, almost unparalleled opportunity to, to adopt these kind of technologies. We've just started to work with Medtronic around digital surgery and their solutions allow actually operations to be recorded in real time uh, within the within the body, and it's going to be a tremendous sort of addition through the you know the training of our future doctors and nurses. So yeah, I, I think the answer is a very 
resounding yes to this. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Thank you for that. So um, just in terms of wrapping up, then I wanted to, uh, to thank our three speakers, Lucy, Frank and Martin, uh, for taking the time this morning for what was a really interesting discussion. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to say we should do this again sometime. Um, but the next one that's coming up from an ADAPT perspective is going to be on the 27th of July. And we're focusing on uh, spin outs and the innovation ecosystem. So as well as uh, conducting collaborative uh, research and targeted projects with industry, ADAPT also has a very busy um, uh, spin out incubator. So we have 16 teams currently incubating in there. So next uh, late, later in, in uh, next month, we'll be talking about that. So uh, I want to just say thanks for everybody who organized today, for the speakers who contributed, and uh, most of all, the audience who took the time to join in uh, to this morning's webinar. Thank you very much.